Whenever I or anyone else posts a video or an article that's critical of some software practice because it's bad for performance, there are a lot of arguments that ensue, and this is actually good in my opinion. I think people should argue about these things because it helps illuminate what's going on on both sides of the argument, and it causes people to actually go do work to figure out who's right and who's wrong about certain things. That's actually productive, and it leads to a better understanding of where software performance fits into the priorities in our industry. What's not so good is that some segment of the developer community doesn't want to have discussions, let alone arguments, about performance because there is a sort of pervasive attitude that software simply doesn't have performance concerns. We are past the point in software development history where anyone really should be thinking about performance. So whatever else it is that you wanted to do, whatever the programming practice it was that you like, even if people are presenting ironclad evidence, which is hard to come by, but let's suppose you did, ironclad evidence this was a bad idea for performance, you'd still just dismiss that because it doesn't matter, right? Software performance doesn't matter. Now, these kinds of sentiments fall into five basic categories. I've seen tons of them. They happen all the time. And they roughly bucket into, one, there is no need to worry about software performance because hardware is very fast and compilers are very good. And so whatever you do, it will always be fast enough at the end of the day. If you pick the slowest possible language, whatever that is, and write with the slowest possible libraries using the slowest possible architectural decisions, if those were better for you because you liked them better or thought they had better properties for some other reason, it will be fine. The end result will still run plenty fast enough because computers are just that fast. Number two is a different idea. It's saying that, okay, maybe there is a difference to be had, meaning we do know that if we were to pick you know, a particular language, it might be slower than some other language we could pick. Or maybe this particular architectural style is in fact slower than this other one. But it's always too small to matter. It's gonna be like a 10% difference in total or something like that. And we can always live with a 10% difference, okay? Number three is that it's not worth it. Now, this idea is financial. It's essentially saying that we're a business, right? It probably isn't something that like an open source developer would say, but you know, we're a business and we're doing things based on our bottom line. And it simply isn't worth it for us to have better performance, even if it's not too small, even if it, there is a need for it we'd always be better off doing something else. If our version one is slow, our version two doesn't have to worry about making it faster. Instead, we can just focus on adding new features or even just creating new pieces of software because that will be more financially beneficial to us than to actually fix the performance of our software product we have. Number four is that, okay, you know, maybe none of those three are true, but performance is a niche concern. It only matters in very small segments of the industry. So, okay, I admit, a game engine developer has to care. An embedded systems developer has to care. Nobody else does. Web front end, definitely not. Back end, just buy more servers, whatever. It doesn't matter. There's only a few small places that you actually have to care about performance, and everyone else doesn't have to care. Finally, number five is that, all right, none of those four. I agree. It matters for everyone. It is worth it to your bottom line. The gains aren't too small. There is a need for it, yes. But basically no one has to care except a few specific programmers on any given team because no matter what all the rest of the programmers do, all of the performance problems of a product will always automatically be concentrated in a few small hotspots, and then the performance experts just go rewrite those hotspots, and then the thing is as fast as it needs to be. So we don't really ever have to care. An average software developer in an average job position, whatever the common case is, they don't have to care about performance because there's some expert on performance who's going to go deal with the hotspots, and it's fine. These are ridiculous. They are completely, they don't hold any water at all. And if you just go look at basic, easy to interpret evidence, you can see that they're totally false. 
Now, in order to make such a strong claim, I'm going to have to be specific here. When we talk about performance, what I'm talking about is, you know, resource consumption. How much CPU time does this thing take? How much network, you know, time is it spending? Uh, how much disk space is it taking? How much memory, right? Whatever. Whatever the metric is that you might care about that has nothing to do with, like, the correctness of the program. It's producing the results it's supposed to produce. It's just producing them more slowly or taking too much battery life to produce them or taking too much, you know, drive footprint or something like that, right? That's performance. And then the other thing is, what do I mean by saying these are completely false? Well, I don't mean that we can't go find an example of them being true. We certainly can find software that has its performance problems concentrated in a hotspot. That's definitely true. And we certainly could find someone somewhere where performance wasn't worth it to their bottom line. Don't disagree. What I'm saying is that in a discussion about performance where we're talking about the industry on a forum and we're basically saying, does this matter or doesn't it matter? These simply cannot be valid excuses to dismiss the discussion because they are only applicable in very specific circumstances. They simply don't apply to the average programmer. The average programmer absolutely does need to care about performance, and it's easy to show that these are not excuses that get them out of that situation. Now, what is the actual evidence? All you have to do is go look at the actual track record of successful software companies. That's all you have to do. It immediately becomes clear that none of these things can be true. And let me walk you through some of it right now. Let's start with Facebook, because it's a huge company. It employs tens of thousands of software developers. It's one of the most valuable corporations on planet Earth, and they are fairly open about what they're doing and how they're doing their development processes so we can see what happens to their software projects over the past, say, decade or so. In 2009, Facebook announced the rollout of a new storage system. The entire rationale for this system was a performance improvement. It took, quote, a couple years for them to develop this system, and the reason they gave for spending all this time and effort was that it allowed them to do the same amount of work with 50% less hardware. The following year, in 2010, they announced they were, quote, making Facebook 2x faster. Why were they doing this? They said they'd run experiments, which were apparently corroborated by Google and Microsoft, that proved users viewed more pages and got more value out of their site when it ran faster. Was it easy to make Facebook twice as fast? Was it just a few engineers working on some hotspots? Nope. It was an organization-wide effort that took, quote, six months and counting, and it followed a prior year and a half of previous performance work. The effort involved the creation of completely new libraries and systems, as well as total rewrites of several components. In 2012, Facebook announced they had abandoned HTML5 and had rewritten their entire mobile app to be iOS native. This was a six-month ground-up rewrite using the Apple iOS SDK, even though the result, quote, looked nearly identical to the old app. Why did they take six months to rewrite an entire application without adding any new features? To fix what they called the, quote, app's largest pain points, all of which were performance problems. Were they willing to make sacrifices to get these performance improvements? They absolutely were. By moving from HTML5 to native iOS, the company could no longer roll out daily updates, which is apparently very important to Facebook, but they were willing to make that sacrifice for the improved performance. In December of the same year, Facebook announced they did the exact same thing for Android, rewriting the application to be native for the exact same reasons. In 2017, Facebook announced a new version of React called React Fiber. This was a complete rewrite of their React framework, which was meant to be API compatible. So why was it necessary? According to Facebook, the main focus was to make it, quote, as responsive as possible so that apps would, quote, perform very well. In 2018, Facebook published a paper describing how improving the performance of PHP and Hack became a priority for them, and they had to create increasingly more complicated compilers to get their code to run faster. The paper describes a number of techniques employed in the compiler to work around the inherent limitations of these languages that make it difficult for compilers to generate fast code. How much of a performance increase did they get? 21.7%, a percentage which took a, quote, huge engineering effort to achieve. In 2020, Facebook announced that it had done another major engineering effort to reduce the footprint of Messenger by 75%. How did they do this? By rewriting the entire application from scratch. How much work did this take? It was apparently a multi-year effort and was, quote, an even more vast undertaking than Facebook had anticipated. 
Why undergo this massive engineering effort to reproduce the same application in a smaller footprint? Because it was, quote, good business to do so. Just two months later, Facebook announced it was rebuilding the entire tech stack for Facebook.com. Why were they doing this? Because they realized that their existing tech stack wasn't able to support the, quote, app-like feel and performance that they needed. How extensive was the work necessary to rebuild Facebook.com? According to Facebook, it required, quote, a complete rewrite. Strangely, in this post, Facebook claims that rewrites are extremely rare which is a bizarre thing for them to say, considering the fact that, as we've seen, they've already done numerous complete rewrites on other parts of their technology stack. But regardless, this particular rewrite touched a huge cross-section of their technology stack, and they concluded by saying that the work done to improve performance was, quote, extensive, and that, quote, performance and accessibility can't be viewed as a tax on shipping features. Finally, we have one of my favorite Facebook announcements regarding performance. This post from 2021 announces a new release of the Relay compiler. This was a complete rewrite of the compiler in a completely different language. Why was this rewrite necessary? Because their, quote, ability to incrementally eke out performance gains could not keep up with the growth in the number of queries in their code base. What's so interesting about this announcement is that it's about a performance rewrite for a compiler. But one of the main reasons the compiler exists in the first place is because it's needed to improve the performance of apps written with Relay. Relay without the compiler would be too slow, but the compiler itself was also too slow, so they had to rewrite the compiler. It's the nesting doll of performance rewrite announcements. So just in case that wasn't clear enough on its own, there you have Facebook telling you over and over and over again that these things simply do not apply to the average developer position in their company. If there really was no need to worry about software performance, it's always fast enough no matter what language we pick, no matter what libraries we use, why did they have to do things like rewrite things from JavaScript into Rust? If JavaScript is always just going to be fast enough, how would that ever be possible? Why would we need to do that for performance reasons? Similarly, what about all the PHP and hack code? Why are we having to create compilers to try and speed them up? Why are we having to do things like change our entire component libraries or rewrite core interactions from the ground up to speed up the performance of the site if whatever kind of architecture we choose is always going to be fast enough? And again, this was across everything, internal tools. It was involving their web front end, their web back ends, their iOS apps. It was everything. So just the average developer on any product at Facebook, this wasn't true for them. And we saw that. Number two, where were the small gains? All of these gains were huge. They were getting 2x in some places. They had shrunk a thing by 75%, right? There was a thing where they were talking about rewriting the JavaScript compiler to Rust. They got a 5x performance improvement. These are not small gains. These are not 5%, 10%. These are massive performance improvements to their products. Number three, not worth it. Facebook is a publicly traded company. They are assigning engineers to do things that they think will make them money. Now, they can be wrong sometimes, but how often could they really be wrong? If it's not worth it, why are they doing this over and over and over again? Why are they saying that they do customer research and saying that Google and Microsoft do it too and it corroborates their stance. Why are they saying that customers engage more with their product and it's more financially beneficial to them if the performance of the product is higher? They're literally saying that it is worth it and they can prove it with data. Now, number four, niche, what niche? Every part of Facebook's product line was touched by this. Anything you want, iOS, Android, web desktop, web backend, everything, e even their internal tools. They had to do complete rewrites for performance on basically every single one of those things somewhere, in some cases, the entire thing. So there's no niche. These are not games. And it's not just isolated to things that scale even. So their web backend, for example, well, it's a thing that has to scale to millions or billions of users, right? But their web front end, it just runs on one person's little device. They had to do a complete rewrite for that, too. So there's no niche. Everywhere you look, performance improves the quality of the product. And Facebook knows that. So there is no niche. It's worth it, and it's worth it everywhere. Finally, number five, obviously not true either. 
If it was really true that all of these things that Facebook made just had a few hotspots and that was what was causing their performance problems, well, they wouldn't rewrite entire things. You don't rewrite an entire compiler written in JavaScript to be written in Rust because there's some tiny part of the JavaScript that's taking all the time. You just drop that into Rust and call out to it, right? There's foreign function interfaces in all of these languages. You would just rewrite the slow part in Rust. You wouldn't go and rewrite your entire iOS application to be 75% smaller because there was just a little bit of it that was causing it to be bloated. These problems exist across the entire code base. That's the problem. If you're not smart about performance, it won't get concentrated into hotspots. If you don't think ahead of time about how this code base is going to produce a small executable, it won't. It's simply not automatic, and all the data from Facebook that we're seeing showed that clearly. So how are people still taking these seriously? If you just read just Facebook's tech blog is all you need to look at, and you can already see that none of these are true in the average case. You might be able to find them being true in some isolated pockets, but the average developer is constantly being faced with having to do these rewrites and these performance improvements. None of these things is true for them. Now, maybe you're saying, well, okay, like, you know, I just, I have a bad opinion of Facebook or something. Like, I just don't like it. Uh, I, I think that they do everything wrong. And, you know, it, so it's, it's cherry picking to just focus on Facebook. If you were to look at some other company, you wouldn't find this. It's only Facebook. And yeah, okay, they're a very important company and they employ lots of software developers. And maybe if you worked there, you have to stop making these excuses. But everywhere else, you can still make the excuses. Well, I mean, let's see if that that's true. We could instead look at Twitter, who in 2011 announced that they had rewritten their entire search engine architecture because of increased search traffic. They changed their backend from MySQL to a real-time version of Lucene and replaced Ruby on Rails with a custom-built Java server called Blender, all for the stated reason of improving search performance. The following year, they announced they had made an entire system for performance profiling so they could optimize their distributed systems. In the same year, they also announced extensive optimizations to their front end, which required undoing a bunch of architecture decisions they had made two years prior, which proved to be bad for performance. In 2015, they announced they completely replaced their analytics platform with a brand new system they wrote from scratch called Heron. But apparently, Heron's performance wasn't good enough, so in 2017, they announced they'd done additional low-level optimizations on it. Apparently, those optimizations also weren't good enough, because in 2021, they decided to replace Heron completely, along with several other pieces of their core infrastructure, in order to improve their back-end performance. Of course, we don't have to stick with Twitter, either. If you'd prefer Uber, in 2016, they posted an article talking about how they had moved to Schemaless, a custom-written data store. They claimed this was necessary because if they continued to use their existing solution, Postgres, quote, Uber's infrastructure would fail to function by the end of the year. The move required a complete rewrite of the entire infrastructure, took, quote, much of the year, and involved, quote, many engineers from their engineering offices all around the world. Also in 2016, they announced they had written PyFlame, a custom p-tracing profiler for Python. The first reason they cited for writing their own profiler was that, and I'm not making this up, the existing Python profiler was too slow to use accurately. Why did they need a profiler in the first place? Because they wanted to, quote, keep their compute costs low. If you'd like an example of what kind of backend services they had to profile and then rewrite to keep those costs low, you need look no further than that new schemaless data store they'd announced the previous year. Apparently, they'd written the entire thing in Python only to find that Python was too slow. They then had to completely rewrite all the worker nodes in Go for no reason other than to increase their performance. During that same time period, Uber was apparently rewriting their entire iOS application in Swift. This harrowing thread from December 2020 details the series of development disasters caused by that decision. The entire thread is an amazing read and details some of the heroic efforts required to ship a Swift app at all. Even so, Uber ended up having to take, quote, an eight-figure hit to their bottom line because there was no way to get their Swift app size small enough to allow the inclusion of an iOS 8 binary for backwards compatibility. In 2020, Uber announced they were rewriting their Uber Eats app from the ground up in a complete rewrite that took an entire year. Why was a complete rewrite necessary? They only gave two reasons, and one of them was performance. In 2021, Uber announced another complete rewrite, this time of their fulfillment platform. 
This process took two years and was necessary because, according to Uber, quote, the architecture built in 2014 would not scale. I can keep going like this as long as you want. This same pattern seems to repeat itself at every tech company that shares public information about their development processes. Examples are everywhere. You can do it with Slack. You can do it with Netflix, Yelp, Shopify, LinkedIn, eBay, HubSpot, PayPal, Salesforce, Microsoft. You get the idea. With so much clear evidence that it does not take any kind of real investigation to find, Hopefully it is clear that these excuses simply don't cut it. They are not reasons why the average developer in the common case can simply ignore performance and never learn about it. Especially if you have ambitions of working at a successful software company and at a well-paying software job, the more successful the company, the more common it is for us to be able to go to these blogs and find them constantly worried about performance. Because as their software becomes used by more people and things have to scale, or when they're trying to get more money out of their interactions with their customers, performance becomes even more important. So unless your goal is to be an unsuccessful software developer at an unsuccessful software company, these can't be good excuses. Now here's the thing, there's still tons of arguments we can have about software performance. The evidence that we saw is totally consistent with wanting to do something like a quick and dirty release for V1. It's very common to do things like not care that much about your architecture when you're just trying to get a product out and see if it works at all. So it may be that you also don't care about performance during that time, right? We see so many rewrites about performance that suggest that the early ones were not made with performance in mind. So there's still plenty of arguments and you know, analysis we could do to figure out how often does performance matter and where in the product life cycle. Maybe it matters not that much right out of the gate and then very much in V2 because you're trying to like make sure that everything is, is smoother now and scales well and, and consumers have a good experience, right? So there's plenty of still discussion about how the concerns get balanced and what kinds of architectures work well for that and, and how much do you need to care in V1 to not really make V2 very painful to get the performance that you want. That stuff is great. That's what we should be talking about. What we shouldn't be doing is making excuses not to talk about it. Here's the good news. Because maybe it's bad news to people that they have to start thinking about software performance. Maybe they're dreading that. Maybe the reason they're making these excuses is because they just don't want to learn. They don't want to learn it because they think it's going to be too hard. The good news is times have changed. I think where some of these attitudes originally came from were observations about something that's not really software performance. It's a specific maybe thing like hand-rolled assembly code. Nobody really hand-rolls assembly code anymore. That is an incredibly niche, incredibly hotspot thing that there's almost never any need for and where the difference is very small and it would be very unlikely to be worth it. All five of those things are true about hand-rolled assembly today and they weren't true about hand-rolled assembly in the 1980s, for example. So the good news is you can keep these excuses for a few things that have to do with software performance and hand-rolled assembly is really the one that, I, that comes to mind. However, software performance is about a lot more than hand-rolled assembly. It's about figuring out how your network architecture is going to work and how you're going to do things like batching requests and make sure that you don't create latency chains of you know, dependent things that are going to access the network. It's about figuring out how you're going to scale. It's about figuring out how to be efficient so you don't use too much disk space at the data center. It's about figuring out how you're going to manage memory in you know, smart ways so that you're not going to have problems on you know, mobile devices and all these sorts of things, how to conserve battery life. All of those things are crucial software performance concerns that require you to understand the fundamental ideas of software performance. And they probably require you to understand things like how to read assembly language, for example, so that you know what the CPU is actually doing when you write certain pieces of code or when you make certain architectural decisions. But that is way easier to do than to learn to write highly optimized hand-rolled assembly code, right? So times have changed. Your job will be much easier now if you decide to start taking software performance seriously. So there's really been no better time, in a way, 
to stop making these excuses because the work you have to do to get up to speed on software performance and start making better choices in software architecture, in language choices, in library choices, and all of those sorts of related things that have to do with software performance, the buy-in is really small compared to what it was. So I really think we would benefit from just retiring these excuses to stop making these excuses and start learning about performance and we will make much better software and we'll have a much easier time doing it because we won't be faced with these multi-year rewrites from scratch either because if we just do a little bit of work to always preserve those performance options, things get a lot easier in a lot of software architecture problems.